Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the session of Managing Expectations and Development, session by David Burns. David is the head of open source uh, in a program at the browser stack. Uh, without any further delay, David, over to you. Hello, uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I really appreciate it. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about managing expectations in development. Um, this is a, a topic that kind of, I didn't think I would ever need to talk about, uh, but after kind of helping out with, uh, selecting speakers for this conference and working through things, there are a number of things where I kind of expected certain bits to work or not work. And, um, because I'm kind of an old curmudgeon nowadays, uh, and so curmudgeon for those who don't know someone who kind of just grumbles a lot. Uh, I kind of wanted to talk about it and kind of make sure that, you know, when we're doing things in development, that we actually concentrate on managing expectations and what that actually means for everyone. Uh, this is going to be the agenda. Um, we'll talk about kind of how projects are generally set up from the start and what I think they're always missing, uh, how to be able to deal with not being able to test everything. Um, and this is a kind of really big one, um, how to handle feedback and improve quality of software. I think that is one of the biggest things that I see as a kind of engineering manager, um, and kind of someone who works a lot with community. Um, and then when other people are kind of managing expectations, how to handle that situation, because it's important. Um, and hopefully my last slide will help you understand that. So, uh, what do I mean by expectations? As a software engineers, um, and I kind of mean that anyone who uses a, uses Selenium as so estates and things like that, you are a software engineer. Um, don't let anyone tell you you're not. And that's your first kind of set of expectations that you should manage with people. You know how to code uh, just as good as people working on the back end, the front end, things like that. And you, your focus is on slightly different things to them. When we start out in our career, it always feels like our managers are like this character on the screen. Whenever they, whenever we make a mistake, small, big, whatever, this is the feeling, at least I had in my career when I started. And I had some of the nicest managers out there that if I got something wrong and I didn't tell anyone, or I kind of tried to hide it by solving problems and then taking a little bit longer or kind of spending too much time, I always kind of felt like this was always the situation that was happening. Um, and I'm pretty sure if I kind of go back and relive some of those experiences, I kind of feel this is what they do. They're looking at their watch, maybe not kind of saying so much, but that kind of anger uh, is more, is less palpable. It's less like you can less feel it. And so they're going, oh, we're behind on things. What knock on effects is this going to have? And so by not managing our expectations, we don't know how people are going to perceive us, um, how they're going to react to us. Um, and how, and we also, by not managing by kind of not sharing expectations as managers, we don't let people know what is also being held up, right? It's quite easily, it's quite easy for us to compartmentalize what we're doing, how we're doing it, um, and never think about kind of what's happening in the cubicle across from us. Uh, it's the, if you're a so pure software developer and you're kind of doing all your unit tests and you done your like initial selenium test and you need to pass it over to the QA department for them to augment the work that you're doing so that it's a high quality project. Um, you don't always necessarily see kind of the impact that it has downstream or even upstream. And so there's a lot of things that we need to think about when we're 
working on our projects and how we manage the expectations of our colleagues, our friends, uh, and everyone around us. I'm going to put in a, a nice story about me. When I first started my career, I used to do 10, 11 hours. I was working in a bank. Um, I now kind of tell people not to work in banks uh, because of it. And it's not necessarily because of the banks themselves, but kind of the expectations that go around with it. I would get into work. I would do these 10, 11 hours. Um, sometimes I'd fall behind on projects. I felt that my manager was that first image. And so I would kind of work and work and work and kind of work through the problem without trying to ask for help because asking for help felt like a failure. And it's quite easy to get into that mindset. And I see this a lot um, with kind of my colleagues who kind of, they don't want to kind of approach me. Not that it's, I'm not approachable, is that that feeling of failure really creeps in, which then leads to them working these extra hours. And anyone who's kind of ever reported to me will tell you, the first thing I will tell you is if you're doing extra hours, that is the problem. Not that you can't solve the problem, but the, the thing you're doing is the extra hours. That is a big problem and we need to solve that. And then I start supplying root cause analysis because I'm a QA person at heart and I try to solve why something is failing um, and why I got into management was mostly because people are a different type of puzzle to computers. Um, they're just as exciting to work with, um, just as hard to solve. Um, and every time you look at a problem uh, and a person that's having that problem, it is always unique and you need to kind of build up these tools. And it's led me to the situation where I need to manage the expectations that I give out as a manager, but also how do I manage upwards to my manager uh, and say, hey, this is the thing that's missing and we need this solved, but also giving the tools to people because the mad hatter here always had this famous saying, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late for an important date. And this is the thing that I used used to be when I was younger. I would kind of miss out on certain things because I kind of felt like I needed to get this thing finished before I could um, go home that day. And if that meant I left home, left work at seven o'clock at night and I'd been in there for 12 hours, so be it. But it wasn't healthy. And actually, when I look back on it, I kind of think it might have negatively impacted my career. So... Now that I've kind of put this idea that we need to be focusing in on creating a healthy environment where expectations are of us are shared downwards, but also when we're doing wrong, we share them upwards. A good example of this is that if you've ever kind of worked with product managers, product managers will kind of, they've got this thing that they're always working towards startup Founders are kind of effectively product managers in a different way. So they will talk about the term minimum viable product, right? What can we get out there to start getting feedback, right? And in our career, we should be thinking the same. As a intern, my minimum viable product is me turning up to learn, right? As a senior engineer, staff engineer, and upwards, uh, we need to start adding features to our careers to make sure that our minimum viable product for that area is what we're expecting and what our managers are expecting, what our, uh, our peers are expecting and everyone around us, right? We start with our kind of the donut on the left. And as we grow our career, we sprinkle some different things and we grow and we can become those individuals, right? that are amazing and we can build this out. But minimum viable project products also have their problems. And so when we start setting up our projects, we never think about testing. 
this is a common trend. Uh, I don't think anyone will disagree with us, but because we're always thinking about like where we need to be, testing is this thing at the end, but quality is the most important thing at the same time. It's this weird paradox that we've built in um, the software development world. Which then leads to us creating scenarios where testing is hard. We've built out our test suites. We've built out everything that we need to. We've got our minimum viable products. And then suddenly with Selenium uh, and Playwrights and Cypress, right? Like there's this common theme. Um, and I kind of talked about the testing framework's not the problem. It's everything else. Uh, when it comes to flakiness, we get into the situation of it's not easy being green. If we look at projects, uh, like not projects, companies like Google, uh, Facebook, Mozilla, anyone that has hundreds of thousands of end-to-end -end tests, the one thing you will notice is that their CI is never 100% green. And they've got into a situation where they've learned to deal with not being able to test everything and not everything being green all the time. Their focus is knowing what is important, what is the high-risk items, are those things always correct, and are the other things fixable over time? Um, at Mozilla, the, the way things were approached was there was a what we call sheriffs, uh, Mozilla called sheriffs. I know this is a general term that goes to large companies who are always the team that looks over, over the CI and goes, this test has a 10% uh, chance of failing all the time. And if that delta, uh, like if the, the delta of failure increases over time, that's the problem that needs to be solved. Not that necessarily the flakiness. You don't need to rewrite all your tests from Selenium to Cypress, then get to more flakiness over time, and then decide to rewrite everything to playwrights. Flakiness is kind of a hard problem, but it's not necessarily the testing tool. It's how you approach testing that inherent knowledge in the back end. And we need to be able to set the expectation that we can't test everything and it's okay at the same time. And we need to manage those expectations with our managers, with our clients, with everyone, um, that we will do our best, but quality is never assured, right? Despite the paradox of the the name that we in the field that we work. When we start getting, we told people that we can't test everything, but we also at the same time want to be able to improve testing. So how can we go about improving the quality of our software without necessarily testing everything? We can employ certain tools to help us, observability like uh, open telemetry. Building that into our systems improves things. Um, if you've worked with product managers, you'll have heard the term NPS, uh, which is the net promoter score. And that's like, how many people are enjoying using our software? Sometimes we'll ask this, the stupidest of questions, like, uh, would you tell your friends to install Windows? Um, that's an NPS type question that's come out of Microsoft in the past. And people go, well, I need an operating system. This is the one I was given. I can't really, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. But we can improve the quality of our software by kind of going to our developers. Hey, this is the tool that I w want to use because I can get the most out of it. This is the tool. I will teach you how to use it. And the expectation is that we will work together to build this out. And again, we don't need to have hundreds and hundreds of tests. Um, Simon Stewart famously said at Selenium Conference London, I think all the way back in 2016, that all you need is one Selenium test. His reason for one was that uh, if I told you 10, you would focus on the 10. But if I told you one, you would try to focus in on kind of the idea that you just need that one good test because it's at the top of the pyramid. And I agree with him. We need to set that expectation of 
be able to do what we can uh, as and when we can do it. And that we shouldn't be working overtime to kind of get certain bits out. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. But uh, on, on the average, we need to kind of care about us because if we care about us, we create better things over time. But we also need to be able to react to people managing expectations. If I were a technical project manager or kind of director of engineering, what I kind of hope people don't ever see me doing is a face like this. When they come to me and go, David, I'm really sorry. We're running behind. I don't know what we can do to solve it, right? Things happen. Life throws us curveballs all the time. And we need to be able to manage our expectations of people, of projects, and all of that. And as leaders, we need to do it in a meaningful way. We need to kind of look for the positives, right? We need to look for opportunities to learn, right? And so the more we kind of learn from what people are saying to us, the better we can approach it. Um, and how we as leaders and as kind of engineers and who are kind of setting and managing expectations is that uh, always protect the person below you. The uh, there was a, an amazing uh, engineering manager at Opera that I knew kind of while I was at Mozilla. And his favorite saying was that uh, as a leader, I need to be a shit umbrella. I need to take all the rubbish that comes, but protect my team. I will manage the expectations upwards um, as long as my team are managing it upwards to me. And I will protect them in the best way because we'll learn, we'll do things better. And the next time this problem happens, it's going to be easy. We need to iterate, right? My, fa my favorite saying that I encourage all my team is that it's fine to fail because fail means first attempt in learning. And we should do that regularly with what we're doing. Because if we're managing expectations, we can all be happy and we can all kind of get to where we want to be and do uh, amazing things. And quality will always be there with us because we're improving it all the time. And my final slide, well, really final slide, uh, is when thinking about this, uh, managing expectations will manage your career. If you tell people how you're doing well, uh, and if you're not doing well, how you would plan to fix it or asking for help and never being afraid to do that. So managing this will kind of manage your career and I promise it will do amazing things for you. So with that, Oh, there was an image over here. That's not loading. Uh, but that's it. Thanks for listening to me. Um, I hope you that was useful. Um, it's not really Selenium related, but it's kind of good for your career. Thanks. Thanks, David. Thanks a lot. I'm sure everyone in this session, you know, kind of related with that. At every point of time, everyone has faced those expectations and, you know, trying their best to meet those expectations.